Few uh, experts in urban studies can claim to have been as influential uh, in terms of influencing policymakers as much as our next speaker. Richard Florida has been uh, described as perhaps the leading urban theorist of our time. He's a professor and director of the uh, Martin Prosperity Institute at the University of Toronto, and he's uh, a best-selling author of books including The Highly Influential, The Rise of the Creative Class, Who's Your City, and The Great Reset. His presentations have been described variously as uh, inspirational, spellbinding, even mesmerizing. So I'm sure we're in for a treat. Please welcome Richard Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's, it's wonderful to be here with all of you uh, talking about this really critically important nexus of urbanization and health. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Lord Mayor of Copenhagen uh, and also uh, Mr. Mr. Sorensen and all of our colleagues from Novo for uh, making this happen. Uh, their leadership, your leadership on this issue is really critically important. And I'd also like to say thank you and congratulations to all of the cities uh, that are here and that are part of the Cities and, and Diabetes program globally. I've been to most of the cities here and I know enough about them to be a little bit dangerous. And what I really want to talk about today are, are two things. Why, in fact, cities and urbanization are both the, the greatest opportunity and the greatest challenge of our life, and talk a little bit about what I have been focusing on in my own research and what's of critically importance to you, the increasingly important connection and nexus between urban living, urban lifestyles, urbanization, cities, and health, and why I think we, together, from the private sector, from the government and public sector, from the nonprofit and NGO sector, from the university sector, are so important in, in, be, in the beginnings in stewarding and shepherding the change that we have to make, not only in our five or seven cities individually, but around the globe. You see, we are going through the greatest economic and social revolution of all time. We are all living through the most tumultuous and disruptive economic period in human history. You see, before our time, and if you scroll back through all the millennium that humans have been on this earth, the cornerstone of wealth creation has been the use of natural resources and physical labor power, really in agricultural or, or simple small-scale communities. We began by settling around fertile riverbeds and river deltas. We developed into small-scale trading communities. We expanded our role in the world and we developed simple manufacturing and we had the great industrial revolution. You think about the industrial revolution, how dramatic and how epical and how tumultuous that was. But still, even during the Industrial Revolution, when we increased productivity by hundreds of times, when we began to see people migrate from farming communities into small-scale and then growing cities, mercantile cities, trading centers, industrial towns, still, the cornerstone of wealth creation was the combination of the natural resources, the raw materials, the coal and iron ore, the petroleum, that was in our ground and in our land, and the application of human physical labor power. If you look back and read all of the classical economists, from Adam Smith to David Ricardo to Karl Marx, they all talked about the same thing. In order to grow the economy, we had to optimize three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. 
Our productivity was measured by the number of workers or percentage of workers of share or workers per ton of stuff produced. Physical output per capita. But something's happened in the past 20 or 30 years that has changed the economic formula and changed the economic calculus. Take this city and this country. Take this neighborhood that we, were, that we are in today. Great factory complexes across Europe, across the United States, across Canada, across the advanced countries began to deindustrialize, and, and just in the building we're in. A former industrial building that is used for conference and social events and parties. We began to deindustrialize, and the nature of our economy started to change to something new and something quite different that people only now are grappling to understand. We began to shift from an industrial to a post-industrial economy from a manufacturing to a service economy, to a technology-driven economy, an information economy, a knowledge economy, or what I like to call an urban creative economy. A hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, more than half of the working population of Denmark or Sweden or Canada or the United States or the United Kingdom worked on farms. Less than 5% of the workforce were members of what I have come to call the creative class. Scientists, technologists, engineers, innovators, researchers, healthcare professionals, educators, lawyers, managers, entrepreneurs. By the year 1950, we had become fully industrialized societies. Now 50% of the workforce in Denmark, across Europe, in the advanced countries were members of the blue collar working class, working in factories and industrial organizations. Less than 10% of us were employed and members of the creative class. Beginning 20 years ago, the change is ignited. Across the world, the creative class has expanded exponentially. In this city, 50% of the workforce are members of what I call the creative class. Scientists, technologists, engineers, managers, Across Europe, more than a third. In Singapore, half. And in the great cities of the world, like Copenhagen, like Stockholm, like San Francisco, I could go on, 50% in the cities themselves, 85 or 90% in the urban cores. The creative class is to our time what the working class was to our parents' and grandparents' time. It is the great driver of economic and social change and it is happening in cities. Now, why do I call it a creative class? It's not the information we create or the technologies we produce. It's not the knowledge that we collect by going to school that makes our economy tick. In fact, at a deeper level, if you go back and read the classical economists, if you read the moral philosophies of Adam Smith, or you read Karl Marx, they will tell you the same thing. The thing that powered the old industrial economy was the physical labor power that was unique to human beings. It was the thing that powered the economy and the thing that made us human. But in fact, if you look at your children or grandchildren, your nieces or nephews, you look at any great entrepreneur or artist, musician, singer, painter, great civic leader or mayor, it's not our physical labor that powers the economy anymore. It's not our physical labor that distinguishes us from other species. It's the creativity that we as a species share with one another. And I didn't come to this theory by studying now. I came to this theory by studying manufacturing companies across the world as a young professor 20 and 30 years ago. And when I toured the great factories of Europe, and when I toured the great factories of Asia, and when I found myself standing outside Nagoya, Japan, as the manager of a steel mill told me when I asked him where the revolutionary production process in his steel mill came from, he said, Professor Florida, this didn't come from a research center. This didn't come from a set of innovators. This didn't come from an engineering group. That this didn't come from a university. It came from the people on this factory working together 
The factory itself is a living laboratory. I learned this from my father. My dad's name was Louis Florida. He was the son of Italian immigrants to the United States. He left grade school in the seventh grade to take up work in a factory in Newark, New Jersey, in the old industrial district that looked, in fact, the factory worked and looked just like this. And when I was a young boy, I wanted to know what my father did for a living. And I would beg him to take me to work, and he said, Richard, I work in the factory so that you don't have to. It's your job to get an education and to better yourself. But on Saturdays, when the plant was running overtime, and I would ask my father, he would take me to that factory. And I would look at the machines, and they were making eyeglasses just like these. I would look at the machines in that factory producing eyeglasses, and I was fascinated by technology, as I am to this day. And my dad told me something I would later hear from every great CEO I would meet subsequently as an adult. But my dad told me this first when I was 11 or 12 years of age. It's not the technology. It's not the machinery. It's not the equipment that makes this factory great. It's the knowledge. It's the intelligence. It's the creativity of the people who work here. So that's the basic economic revolution, a shift from an older agricultural or industrial economy to a new economy across the world. And you know this, not only if you're from the United States or Canada or Mexico City, you know this in Shanghai and in China because you discuss it all the time. The nature of our economy is shifting from an old industrial system to a new system where innovation and creativity is the key. Which brings me to the second and more important revolution, enabled by the first. If the old economy, if that old industrial economy was powered by giant multinational companies and factories, if my own father, worked at the same company from the day he turned 13 years of age and could get a work permit to the day he turned 65 and could retire. When the company structured our lives as working people, created jobs and employment and ran the economy, where I'm from in the United States, it was often said, what is good for General Motors is good for the country. Today, the key economic and social organizing unit of our time is different. The industrial economy was an economy powered by large corporations. The creative and innovative economy is an economy powered by what you all lead. You, we are the CEOs together of the new knowledge and creative economy because the knowledge and creative economy is nested in cities. Cities, our places, our communities, our metropolitan areas have replaced the corporation as the central economic and social organizing unit of our time. And that's why what we're doing here today is so important. We are knitting together the fabric, the global partnerships between corporations and nonprofits and public sector and government and university research to steward that shift, which still so few people see. The creative and knowledge revolution is an urban revolution. Remember those statistics I told you about? 50% of people working on farms 100 years ago, half the population working in factories 50 years ago. 5% in the creative economy, 10% in the creative economy in 1950. The urban revolution has been even more powerful. Just a couple hundred years ago, less than 4% of the population of the world lived in cities and urban areas. 95% of us lived on farms in rural areas. In the year 1900, Less than 15% of the world's population was urbanized. Well, you know the statistics. You were here this morning. You read. Now half of our population lives in cities and urban areas around the world. In the next 50 years, that will rise to two-thirds, maybe by three-quarters. We will put more people in cities over the next century than live in cities today. About three and a half billion people across the world live in cities now. Over the next 50 to 100 years, we'll end up with eight or nine billion people across the world being urbanized. 
And 90% of that urbanization will occur where it hasn't happened now, in the emerging economies of Southeast Asia, Africa, and parts of the Middle East. This is the greatest economic revolution in all time, and we will spend more trillions of dollars or euros building cities in our lives than have been spent building cities in all of human history before us. This point bears emphasis. We will put more people in cities, in urban areas, and spend more people, trillions of dollars, building cities than has happened in all of human history before us. This is earth shattering. And I would submit to you that urbanization is the grandest of all the grand challenges we face. Climate change, energy efficiency, poverty, conflict and terrorism, peace and tolerance, jobs, poverty reduction, addressing inequality and segmentation. Each and every one of those problems, if we are to solve them, are not going to be solved at the G20 summit that is meeting today. They are going to be solved by making our cities better and doing urbanization right. You see, we have a choice now. We can either act together like we are today, led by Novo and all of your efforts. We can either act together to do it right, or we can just try to wing it by the seat of our pants. And over the next hundred years, depending on how we do, depending on the kinds of cities we build, the kinds of infrastructure we invest in, the kinds of health care and health outcomes we achieve, We'll either end up with a world in which the climate is out of control and poverty spirals and conflict and terrorism grows, or we'll end up in a world which is a much better place. You see, I want to give you insight into even more why cities are so important. People somehow believe that in the age of the Internet, in the age of new technology, in the age of Skype and Google communications, air travel. We have shrunk the world, we've conquered distance, and place and community are no longer important. In the words of my friend, the great New York Times writer, Thomas Friedman, the world has become flat. Well, Maybe in certain things it has become flat. He, he uses the example of manufacturing that has migrated across the world. He uses the example of call centers that you call for assistance that have relocated to where labor costs are cheap. But if you look at the most important things, if you look at where innovation comes from, where technology achieved, where new ideas are produced, where economic output is created, if you look at those things, you find that the world isn't flat at all. You find, in fact, that the world is spiky. And the great paradox of globalization is that as the world has become increasingly interconnected, that as we sit in this room from Europe and Mexico, the United States, Canada, China, Asia, as we sit here together in a world that has been shrunken and flattened, we have become more clustered, and concentrated and spiky than ever before. We looked at this because there's no data. Come back to that. There's no data which just allow us to compare cities in Europe to cities in the United States, to cities in Canada, to cities in Asia and China and all the rest. So we took the satellite images of the world at night. We developed computerized algorithms to look at where the centers of the world economy really are. We found that the world today is structured not around 200 nations that are members of the UN, but 40 mega regions, 40 clusters of cities, the Boston, New York, Washington area, greater London, greater Tokyo, the area around Shanghai and Beijing, Mumbai and Bangalore, Sao Paulo and Rio, Mexico City, and I could go on. These 40 mega regions are the real economic drivers of the economy. They produce more than two thirds of our economic output and nine in 10 of our innovations while being home to less than 18% of the world's population. And I'm not the first person to discover this. 
The person who discovered this became a mentor of mine. She was a woman named Jane Jacobs. She was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, didn't have an advanced degree, wasn't a university professor, moved to New York City, and in the 1950s began to study her neighborhood in Greenwich Village, later moved to Canada where she became my friend. And when I got to know Jane, she was in her 80s. She's the most highly regarded urban theorist of all time. One day we were sitting in her living room and I asked her, Jane, what do you think was your most important achievement? She said to me, I think I figured out something that's puzzled all economists to this day. Economists believe, like you, Richard, they believe that economic growth comes from companies. Economists like you, Richard, believe that companies can do things more efficiently by creating, as Frederick Taylor said, or Henry Ford said, a division of labor. By breaking things into very simple tasks and enabling people to do that very efficiently. <laughs> and Jane said, that's not a theory of economic growth. That's a theory of efficiency. If you want to understand where economic growth comes from, you have to understand where new ideas and new innovations are created. And new ideas and new innovations come from one place. They come from when people like us move to cities. When we move to cities and we cluster and concentrate and mix and mingle in cities, that's where new ideas are created. Cities are where ideas come to mate and reproduce. Cities are where ambitious and talented people come to thrive. Cities are where the diverse groups of people from a country or from many countries come to succeed. And I've boiled down that into a simple theory of cities I call the three T's. A great city does three things that create the context for economic growth and economic well-being. The first T is technology. Great cities generate new technology and invest in new technology that powers growth. The second T is talent. Great cities are talent magnets. They are brain magnets. They bring together people who are smart and ambitious to create and to innovate. You see, I lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for nearly 30 years. I saw the great minds of Pittsburgh move away. And Pittsburgh's great export wasn't steel, it was the mines it produced. I saw my students at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh migrate to Silicon Valley and New York and Tokyo and Europe and fashion some of the greatest companies in the world. The key to being a great city is to attract and retain talent. And the third T is tolerance, and it's incredibly important at a time like this. Great cities are the places where people from all walks of life, from both genders, all sexual orientations, all ethnicities, all nationalities can come and thrive and interact. In fact, creativity's prerequisite is diversity. Creativity and cities annihilate the social categories of race and gender and sexual orientation we have imposed on ourselves. Now look at our future. We are going to create more cities. We're going to build hundreds of new cities. We're going to expand cities in place. There is an incredible movement across the world of people not only from the rural areas, but from the suburbs back into the cities. Some call this a great inversion. We are intensifying, we are densifying, we are changing our way of life, and this is not epiphenomenal. This isn't because people love cities or want to live in cities or like to go to good cafes. This is because urbanization and densification are the cornerstone of economic growth. And we have to understand this. It's not human capital accumulation or technology aggregation that are the key to economic growth. It's urbanization and density. And that's what economists have forgotten. They're finally waking up to this fact now. It is densification. It's intensification. It's human beings clustered in cities which are the power 
the fuel of economic growth. Doing it right, getting urbanization right, is the grandest challenge of our time. So over the past decade or two, with my research groups at Carnegie Mellon, the University of Toronto, now at New York University, and with colleagues across the world, and I read the incredible study that Professor Napier and his colleagues and this group of people did looking at diabetes. We've been trying to ferret out what it is about cities that not only increase productivity and increase incomes, the historical basis of my own research, but what is it about cities that can better affect our health and well-being? And that's in particular why I'm so honored to be able to spend time with you here today. The first thing we began to look at was what are the factors that are associated with cities that raise incomes? What are the core factors that in cities enable incomes and wages and material well-being to rise? Well, we, we began to see it was the concentration of this group of people I called knowledge workers or the creative class. Cities and communities that had higher concentrations of this group had higher rates of economic output and higher rates of income. Cities that had greater levels of diversity, however measured, greater levels of diversity, greater levels of tolerance, and when you combine talent and tolerance, higher rates of economic output, higher wages, higher incomes. The next thing we did was we started to look at cities that generate startup companies. And this is fascinating. Almost all the research that was done before ours, all of it, showed that startup companies are a phenomenon of far-flung suburbs. And the image in the minds of people is of the California Silicon Valley spread out suburban area where new companies like Intel or Apple or Google come from. We were able to get the micro data on investment in startup companies and venture capital companies across the entire world. Every single investment. And what we found was something remarkable. Over the course of the past decade, the old idea that technology was a suburban phenomenon that happened in an office park has been turned on its head. The leading centers of venture capital startup investment in the world are vibrant urban centers. It's no longer the Silicon Valley, it's the urban districts that look quite like this in San Francisco. There are two neighborhoods in the world that generate a billion dollars in venture capital investment a year. A billion dollars. They are both in downtown San Francisco. New York City has emerged as the second largest attractor of venture capital. London has come to the heights. Stockholm, Toronto, Copenhagen, Berlin, Shanghai. These are the places that new innovation and others, new startup, are happening. Cities are the breeding ground of artistic, civic, commercial, innovative creativity, they're the places these things flourish. And then we started to turn our attention as new data became available, not only to material well-being and material prosperity, remember the title of my institute is a prosperity institute, to the non-material to the non-economic sources of well-being and happiness. We initially parted with the Gallup organization. We surveyed hundreds of thousands of people across the world as to the things that matter to our socioeconomic well-being, our subjective well-being, to our happiness with our life. And the results that came back floored me. I was not prepared for the results we would get. That the places people in the world were happiest were big, dense, diverse cities. Across the board, when we looked at what were the determinants of people being happy, 
and having well-being, a strong creative class, a strong knowledge economy, lots of density, incredible diversity. Now, you would think, looking at the world today, that places that are diverse are unhappy, that there's a lot of conflict, that there's a lot of problems, but we found just the opposite. Places that were able to value different kinds of people and where different kinds of people were valued, rich people, poor people, people of different sexual orientations, races, ethnicities, religions, happiness rose up. Places where that didn't happen, where groups were siloed and segmented and segregated, happiness sunk. We created a pyramid. I hope you find this interesting. We created, we called a place pyramid. It looks kind of like the great psychologist Maslow's pyramid of needs. You know, where he said we, we first have to make sure we provide for ourselves and we have basic substance and we can eat, we're secure, we don't face physical threat, and then as we get more affluence, we become more concerned with meaning and purpose in our life. We found much the same but somewhat different for cities. And if you're a city leader, if you're a mayor, if you're an urban leader, this is so important. Because we tend to focus only on the base of the pyramid. And not just in the emerging economies. This is just as true as the developed and advanced economies, like a place like Copenhagen or New York or London. At the bottom of the pyramid is the most basic need. Yes, people need to feel safe and secure. We need physical security. But in just about every city today, in the advanced world, we've developed to a point where we have greater safety and greater security in the urban areas than in the countryside. At the next level, we found economic opportunity. Economic opportunity is clearly essential. People needed economic opportunity and jobs to have a salary, to have a living, to make a living, and to make a life. But the three factors across the globe that added materially to our well-being atop the pyramid were different. In the middle of the pyramid was us, the leadership, the stewards, the private sector, public sector, NGO, academic, civic stewards of a community. Was the leadership visionary? Did it have far-reaching goals? Was the leadership accountable? Was it not corrupt? Did the leadership involve me? And this we saw as a trend, particularly with younger people. I see it with my students. The ability to be involved in their community. The ability to be involved in making their communities better. We have partnered with leading design firms like IDEO that are working globally. The ability for young business people like business people at Novo and other corporations, to get involved in projects like this, to get involved in projects in changing their community, were key to how they felt about their lives and their work and their purpose. And when people were more involved and civically engaged, the happiness of the community rose. It's another reason this effort is so important. And the two things at the top of the pyramid, the diversity and inclusiveness of that community, how diverse, how open-minded, how inclusive it was of its people. The more inclusive, the more open-minded, the more embracing, the higher the happiness of the whole community. And at the top, I call it quality of place. Quality of place, not quality of life. The quality of the place itself. Did it invest in its community? Did it have open gr green space? Did it protect its waterfronts? Did it embrace its history? Its artistic and cultural past, was that revered? Were there institutions that were invested in that showed that cultural heritage? Were there places for children to play? Were there playgrounds and bike paths that brought people together? What was the quality of place? What were the investments in the place itself? And that quality of place was the number one fact. More important than safety and security, more important than levels of economic opportunity, and of course, all of those five factors went together. And next we began to look at health, and not just overall psychosocial well-being, but health outcomes. And I think that's why I was so excited to come here and meet with all of you, the folks at Novo and all of you from these communities, because our research was pointing us on a parallel track. 
you know, if you look at the big killers in our society today, they're, they're not hard to understand. Um, there's obesity and heart disease and smoking and driving around like a maniac in a car. There's a few others. So we began to look at the big things that are associated with ending life prematurely. Overall mortality rates, rates of morbidity, and all of those things. And we began to, to really dig into this, but particularly with obesity and other factors. And I, again, I wasn't, I'm an economist. These are not things that come naturally for me. These are not things, I'm not a medical doctor, although I've met a lot of and begun to collaborate with medical doctors. It's not something that I was made to focus on, so I struggled with it. But as the data came back, it was so eye-opening that the very same factors that I saw being associated with high levels of innovation, with high levels of economic performance, with high levels of economic output, with rising wages and salaries, those very same factors were associated with health outcomes. Um, we did a project just on fitness levels in cities. We began to look at why cities had lower body, body weight or body mass index, higher levels of overall fitness. And the things that came back were higher levels of human capital, higher levels of talent, the same thing that was powering innovation, higher concentrations of the creative class, higher levels of affluence, higher levels of density. Denser places had fitter people. People who walk or bicycle to work. An extraordinary correlation, especially in a place like the United States, when about a percentage of the entire workforce walk, or maybe it's up to 3 or 4% now, walk or bicycle to work. Highly positive and significant associations. What was associated with a lack of fitness? Driving to work alone in your car. The same thing with obesity. We began to probe obesity. What were the factors associated with obesity and the health disaster that obesity is with its strong correlations to type 2 diabetes that your own work is focused on? My God, 400 million people plus today, 650 million projected. Look at the rates in your cities. I think the lowest was 9% and the highest was 17.5%. It's terrifying. And, and these aren't individual problems. You know, I, I think the 20th century, if I look at the 20th century, the industrial epic that we're only now overcoming, it really was this industrialized mindset that you could fix everything with an innovation coming out of a company. You know, you could fix the job problem, you could fix the economic growth problem if we just invested in more companies, if we had more production, if we had more productivity, we'd drive GDP up, if we just had a new pill. And look at, it worked. Look at, hundredfold increase in product, hundredsfold, three, four hundred, five hundred percent productivity increases because of industrialization. We extended, we doubled human life. We had a pill for heart disease and a pill for cholesterol and wonderful devices to manage diabetes and other ailments. Incredible. We, we should congratulate ourselves. But we've now hit the wall. We're, we've just hit the wall. It's the industrialization has come to the age of what economists call diminishing returns. It's so funny. You know, I was thinking about this the other night. We have a, a brand, this is the first time I've traveled, we have a brand new newborn, three weeks old my wife and I, our first child, and I was thinking about this, thinking about this conference, thinking about what's going to change in her life. We got all the pills she needs. We have all the medical interventions she needs. She's not going to get scarlet fever like my dad did and had to recover. She's not going to get diphtheria like my mom did and recover. She's going to manage all of that. But when I was a young boy, there was no such thing as exercise. Think about this. I'm 57. No such jogging was invented in my life. My parents, working people from New Jersey, Newark, if my father put on jogging pants and ran down the street, my mother, she could have put a sports bra on and went out and exercised. They would have took them to the mental hospital. This is invented in our life. But it's not just individual fitness. The doctor tells you, well, you have this condition, you 
you have diabetes, your diet isn't good, your cholesterol's high, well, take a pill and run around, go to the mall and walk, mall walking. A great new industry in my country, the United States. We're going to go to the mall and walk. We know these are not just individual behavior problems. We know as education levels rise, I'm a working class kid. I used to talk with this kind of working class accent you might have heard. How you doing over here? That's how I grew up. My friends in that neighborhood are obese or dead. They're gone. At 57, that generation is gone. My cousins, who didn't have an education, have terrible, if they're alive, terrible physical health. So as our educations rise, as we get smarter, we start to change. At 38 years old, I bought a bicycle. I tried to think about what I, as a boy, like to do. Well, I like to ride my 10-speed bicycle. So I bought a bicycle, and I took up cycling. But I had enough income to do that, and when I met my friends on bicycles, they weren't the working class kids. They were PhDs and advanced degrees and sophisticated people from industry. Novo Nordis, with its own cycling team. And in my 50s, I took up weight training because I knew I didn't want my physical self to deteriorate. I had to train myself to eat, retrain myself to eat better. But that isn't just an individual thing. That's related to socioeconomic class. If you look at the people in our class position, if you look at the people with college degrees and university degrees and sophisticated degrees, university professors have always been thin and fit. It's associated with certain structural characteristics. But then it dawned on me, this wasn't an individual problem. This was embedded in the way we live. It was embedded in the kinds of communities we live in. When we looked at the data, the first thing that struck us is that places like Copenhagen, Boulder, Colorado, San Francisco, the health outcomes were qualitatively different than the working class places where I grew up. And we're not talking about a few years. We're talking about a lot of years. And when we did the work with Gallup, it wasn't just the cause of mortality, it was the length of morbidity, the quality of life leading up to death, where in the creative class, the knowledge class, the educated centers, people not only lived longer, they extended their quality of life years. And as one of my crass friends had said at the time, a researcher, very bald, he said they, they just live a good life until one day they die. It's not like their life is a series of medical interventions that go on and on and on, leading to a long-term decay in quality of life. I, I know this well, by the way. My dad was a smoker. He died of lung cancer. My mom was one of seven sisters. All seven sisters died of breast cancer, except for my mom who died of Alzheimer's. I, I know these illnesses very well, and I know how traumatic they can be. But what we began to find, it was the nature of the community itself that mattered. And, and this is what I think is so interesting and why I look forward to hopefully working with you all more. I'm working with David and his incredible team and this incredible research and why I've been drawn to working more and more with medical scientists and less and less with social scientists. That the nature of the community was so fundamentally important to health outcomes. Well, I mentioned this connection between density. I mentioned this connection between density and innovation and economic growth. Density is a key predictor of better health, no matter how we measured it. We actually created a kind of health, an overall health index. The denser the community, the more urbanized the community, the more people were packed into that community, just the opposite of what you might think. It wasn't the people who lived out in the far off rural areas with lots of space and fresh air. The people who live in the densest areas had the best health outcomes. And again, the nature of that community mattered. The more sprawling, the more far flung, the more commuting by car, the more driving to work alone higher rates of ill health, higher rates of obesity. The more people walk, the more pedestrian friendly, the less reliant we are on cars, the more that is a structural quality of place. 
look, if we're gonna build cities, doesn't this make intuitive sense? That instead of building cities where we drive friggin' cars around and sit on our ass all day and kill ourselves, we built those cities to sell cars. We suburbanized to propel an industrial economy that's over. How many cars do you guys make here in Denmark? I think it's zero last time I looked. We built this suburban, sprawling place basically to power an industrial economy. So when people like my parents bought a little house on the outskirts of Newark, they bought a refrigerator and an air conditioner and a television set and a stereo system and two cars, and it kept the factory lines going where my dad worked. We are now a creative economy where creativity requires density. We're an innovation economy where the more we urbanize, the more innovative we get. The most advanced places, the wealthiest places, like Copenhagen, like Amsterdam, like San Francisco, we can go down the list, have the highest rates of cycling. That's where people are moving back to the city, where they're walking to work. This is the core of innovation, but it's also the core of good health. We have a shift as big as the, bigger than the Industrial Revolution. This shift is bigger than the Industrial Revolution. And what we have to do is bigger than the rise of our first great cities and our first great su suburbs. We have a total reset that we have to do. We have to build cities not simply to produce more stuff and to create more output. We have to build cities where we can innovate, create, and be healthy. I remember when I was doing the research for my book, Rise of the Creative Class, and for you skeptics out there, or your colleagues who might be skeptical, I was trying to understand why these highly innovative companies, these highly innovative companies enabled what I thought of as slacking, lacking off. Why they were enabling people to take breaks whenever they want. Why were they enabling people to go cycling? Why were they enabling people to go out and go for a walk and get an espresso? And one day I was cycling with some friends and they gave me the answer. We don't work on an assembly line anymore where they can time our movements. Creative people work with our minds. And when we, like my dad, when he came home from the factory, he opened a can of beer and he put on his favorite sports team and he sat back. He worked with his physicality all day. He used his back and his arms and his legs. For the creative class, for the knowledge workers, when we engage in physical activity, it resets our minds. That's why those high-tech companies have all of this stuff. When I look around our office, at the university and my research team. When I look around our newsroom at the Atlantic where we created City Lab, I see young people sitting on balls. I see people doing standing desks. We have people on treadmill desks. These things are required not only to keep us healthy, but to keep us fit. Well, when I saw the findings from the diabetes study about isolation, another thing triggered in my mind. I've been working with a group of medical researchers and mental health professionals at the University of Toronto, trying to figure out why suicide rates are rising. And if you read the new study by the Nobel Prize winner, Angus Deaton, and his wife, Anne Case, you know, one of the things they find is, among middle-aged white men in the United States, alcohol-related, drug-related, and suicide deaths are escalating. Well, in Toronto, a city with a much better safety net, not, not quite at your level, but, but a much better safety net, we also have found a, a punch, a spike in suicide rates. And one of the factors there that came clearly into account, along with many others I mentioned, was social isolation. So one of the things that is particularly challenging about urbanization, especially in big cities, whether that's Mexico City or Shanghai or New York or Trend the rest, is where we have a lot of people moving in from the countryside, or in some cases, like Toronto, more than half the population moving in from other countries, leaving behind, I moved 17 times away from, and I can tell you, I'm not a depressive person, 17 times to establish a career with no, no, no spouse. They say the research shows that for every relative or friend you leave behind, it costs you $150,000 in psychic income. So I could feel this loneliness in my own life, but I had support. This isolation of people, this connection between mental health and physical health is something 
that we have to probe in greater detail. But there's something going on in cities and urban areas that, where you don't have that support, where we're highly transient, that isolation factor that seems to trigger, and I saw it in the study of diabetes, and we see it in our own work on mental health. Now, the one other thing that's important to say is, even in the places that have the best health outcomes, and this is what my new book deals with, it's called The New Urban Crisis. It'll be out in about a year the new urban crisis, even in the cities that have the best health outcomes, even in the cities that have the most vibrant economies, even in the cities like Shanghai or London or Copenhagen, go on, that are growing like mad. It's not only that the world is spiky, our cities are spiky. We are seeing incredible divides and in inequality, the likes of which the world has never seen. You know, as we are all members of a global creative class, and all of our wealth and well-being rises, and we all sort of dress the same, wear the same suits, wear the same jeans, drive the same cars, live the same lives. The privileged third of us condition goes up, but there are 66% of people across the world, and more in the emerging economies, across the world who are toiling in low-income, precarious, vulnerable conditions. The people who work in not only manufacturing, but this surge in low-income routine services, retail trade, food preparation, you can go on. Their conditions are sinking, and that divide's working, worsening. You know, that, that's what's behind not only the economic divide we see in our most advanced countries, that's what's behind what happened in Paris. It's what's behind what happened with the attacks on New York a decade ago. That we are living, it's what happened in the riots in London. We are living in a world where economic divides the top, and maybe to, to quote Tom Friedman, the world is flat from the peaks but the valleys get deeper and deeper. And the health outcomes in each of our communities, and I was looking at the maps for Houston and other, it, it was exactly like the same maps we have built in our research group. You could see the concentrated poverty. You could see the concentrated, and, and what happens is that we get trapped. There are areas of vantage and mobility and affluence and areas of just poverty traps and ill health. And the final thing I wanna say is that urbanization really is our grandest challenge for this region, for every country represented in this room, for all of the cities, all of them, urbanization has gone along with growth and good things. That's true of Copenhagen, that's true of Vancouver, that's true of Johannesburg, that's true of Mexico City, Shanghai, and all the rest. For all of us, urbanization has meant a path to prosperity and better health. But for the first time in our history, that's starting to break down. For the first time in our history, in areas of Southeast Asia and in areas of Africa and the newly industrializing world, we are seeing urbanization go along with increased poverty. This has never happened in modern history before. And it's because we live in a global world where we can ship things around, where advantage concentrates. So one of the things we have to commit ourselves to is as this urbanization increases, and as urbanization has lifted boats in our cities, in our societies, in our nations, we have to begin to understand that it's not enough just to push on the level of urbanization, that we need help. If we're gonna fix the problems of health, diabetes, obesity, infant mortality, poverty, violence, crime, and climate change, it's gonna take an effort to act on the urban world. And with all due respect to my great friends who think cities and mayors can do it all, we can do a lot, but we can't do it all. This is going to take a commitment at a global scale of the leading nations of the world, at the leading corporations of the world, of the UN and the World Bank and all the rest to understand that the only way to create a better world is to build better cities, to make sure mayors and their staffs have the training they need, to recognize that we need economic development institutions at the city level, to make sure that our public health and health institutions, in fact, and I will end on this, at the turn of the last century, we had an incredible innovation in medical profession. It was called the teaching hospital. The teaching hospital is where, and there's 600 or so, 650 in the world today, where with the support of great corporations and great foundations and national governments, we said we can cure disease, we can develop new clinical practices, we can train a profession of medical doctors and nurses and expand that around the world. And look at how incredibly better it's made our world. 
we need the equivalent of a teaching hospital for cities. We need some new kind of institution that brings together researchers and practitioners and urban leaders. We need teaching hospitals embedded in all of your cities, but not just for medicine, but for this nexus of urbanization and innovation, creativity, prosperity, and health. It's been an honor to address you, and thanks so much for your patience and listening to me. Very kind, thank you. So the, the advanced billing was all true. That was indeed inspirational. I think a real, a real tour de force. And I think we're very fortunate that Richard's been able to join us today to help shape our thinking, to expand our thinking uh, so uh, magnificently. Please join me in thanking him once again. Thank you.